morning. This morning I shall be reading from Isaiah, the 55th chapter. And as you listen to it, you will hear echoes of what we just read together in the opening of our, uh, of our service, the call to worship and the prayer of confession is taken from this particular, song, uh, this particular passage. Uh, in this passage, uh, the call goes out for us to return to God, and Isaiah points out that David was given power through God, and uh, that nations will all come together under God. And he repeats that God is more powerful than we are. The most interesting part of this passage is the first word, Ho. Yo, hey, pay attention to me. I'm like I'm standing on the corner out here in Babylon somewhere, trying to get people in, you know. Uh, it does catch your attention when you first see it. So this is Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 9. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness of the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord our God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, that he may have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. This is the word of the Lord. Luke chapter 13 is the focus of our New Testament reading, an unusual passage that deserves a lot of uh, exploration on its own, and yet most of our preaching time today will be around the Old Testament reading, which is so rich and full of beautiful and powerful imagery. But this gospel story is an interesting one, especially made me think this week of that sinkhole opened up under someone's house and swallowed him up, and so one of the things Jesus uh, says in this passage, that wasn't his fault, which of course was the world view at the time. If something bad happened to you, if you got sick or an accident or whatever, that you had done something, or maybe even your ancestors had done something to deserve that. Jesus says no. And then this little parable about the fig tree that uh, the farmer was willing to give up on, but uh, Jesus says no. Just give it a little more time. And so it's a message of God's grace. So that little mini-sermon, no extra charge this morning about the gospel reading. And then we'll focus on the Isaiah passage. So listen as I read this gospel story from Luke chapter 13. At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way that they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, 
For three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year, until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Precious God, once again, we gather on this first morning of the week to sing your praise and to look into your word and on this first Sunday of the month to gather around your table. Send us from this place having heard your word, but also as prepared to be doers of the word as well. May now the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Grocery shopping is not my favorite thing to do. That is, unless we're going to Costco or Sam's Club. I haven't yet been to BJ's, but I assume it's sort of the same kind of thing. I like going to these stores, especially on a Saturday, because of all the free samples. Right, guys? I can practically get a free lunch grazing on anything with a toothpick in it. You know, there's an art form to this thing to do it right. You have to look interested in whatever it is they're trying to sell. They point to the freezer where it's kept, and you, you nod, and you stand there for a moment and say, that's not a bad price. And then you quietly move on to the next uh, sample stand. You know, the marketplace is an important part of every culture, isn't it? In our culture, we drive our cars to a big parking lot and grab a shopping cart and fill it with everything we need. And unless we want a free sample, we don't have to talk to anyone until we get to the checkout. In other places around the world, the marketplace is much more than that. It's, it's much more than somewhere just to get groceries. It's the society in a microcosm. It's community. I've been to markets in places like Mexico and Honduras and the old city in Jerusalem. They're colorful places with family-run stalls selling everything from vegetables and meat to handmade crafts and items. Often there will be people begging for money on the outskirts of the market. They're not allowed in, but they try to catch you on your way in or your way out. And maybe you feel some compassion and toss them a peso or a shekel or some of your food. Well, Isaiah is describing a market scene in these opening verses of chapter 55 that Art shared with us this morning. See, the Israelites are in Babylon. So the market that they would have gone to would have been foreign to them. They were the outsiders. They were unwanted immigrants. They were marginalized. So even if they had money, they may not be welcome in all parts of the market. Maybe there was their own Hebrew section of the market where they kept to themselves and sold things to one another. So Isaiah begins with an invitation to the Hebrew people. Ho, everyone. He's getting their attention, as Art said. Ho, hey you. Or like the carnival of years past. Hear ye, hear ye, step right up. Everyone who is thirsty. Well, who isn't thirsty? It was, after all, the desert, what is now modern-day Iraq. But something interesting can happen in desert heat. You don't necessarily know you are thirsty. It's so dry. This summer, Sarah, Shina, and I will take 15 high school youth. Yeah, 15 now. The number keeps growing on a mission trip to West Virginia. It may not be terribly hot there because of the elevation. We'll see. But I've taken youth and adults on over a dozen summer mission trips, some to very hot places. And one of the things we constantly have to do is remind the youth to stop and take a drink. If we left them to drink just when they are thirsty, they would get dehydrated. Isaiah is reminding Israel and you and me that we are thirsty, even if we don't know it. We're thirsty for God. 
And we need to come to the waters to drink often. In fact, I get thirsty when I start talking about it. <laughs> Doesn't that make you jealous? <laughs> come to the waters to drink often. Or we become spiritually dehydrated. Come to the waters, and you that have no money, come, buy, and eat. Step right up. Come on in. You are a valued customer. Come into the best shops of the market and buy. Come buy the good stuff, good wine and rich food. But with what? You have no money. But come and buy anyway? What on earth is Isaiah saying? Come and buy with no money. Most commentaries on this passage focus on God's generosity in that statement. Come to the market because everything is free. It's not just the sample with the toothpick. It's everything is free today. But that interpretation is only part of it. And in fact, it may miss the point entirely. Isaiah doesn't say, come and get free food. Isaiah says, come and buy, but without money and without price. There's a deep paradox here that helps illustrate something very important about the reign of God. In God's realm, there is a difference between charity and social justice. Charity offers a hand out to those who are in need, and it's a good thing as far as it goes. But inherent, inherent in charity is the humiliation of one person giving and the other person receiving. Social justice recognizes the worth and dignity of each person. Social justice seeks to find ways to help people while maintaining their dignity. Elizabeth and I have worked at our interfaith food pantry, and I'm so impressed at how hard they work there to show respect to the clients. First of all, they call them clients. And the food is arranged to make it seem as much like a regular grocery store as possible. And they're given bags, just like in a regular store, to take their items home and sent off with a smile. And in another example, I'm so glad that the food stamp system in our country is no longer food stamps. It's a credit card, so to speak. Can you imagine how humiliating it would have been to count out paper stamps while people in behind you watched with disgust at how long it was taking? A family that needs help to feed itself deserves to do so with dignity, because they too are children of God. The invitation of Isaiah is not come and get a free handout. The invitation is to come and buy. In God's economy, we are all valued customers. Have you ever been to stores that are way out of your league? Over the holidays, Elizabeth and I were in the city, and we stopped in Saks Fifth Avenue to look around and use a bathroom. I tried to not gasp out loud when I looked at a price tag. For example, I like leather coats, and whenever I see a rack, I always have to stop and look. I turned over the tag on one that I thought would be you know, several hundred dollars way out of my league. But, uh, you know, I'm a J.C. Penney sort of guy. That's kind of more my league. But I choked when I saw the tag, $4,000, more than I paid for my boat. Now, maybe that doesn't say much about my boat, but <laughs> it's, it floats. It floats most of the time. But something about me that day and what I was wearing said I was not a Saks Fifth Avenue customer because no one paid any attention to me. No one offered to come and help. Maybe it was my generic blue jeans or my 10-year-old leather coat, but they knew I was just looking. Isaiah says, come into Saks Fifth Avenue and buy. You are a valued customer here, even if you don't have money. Remember those MasterCard ads that would list the cost of several items and then declare the reason for the purchase as priceless? Remember that? One went something like fishing rod and reel, $50. Boat rental, $100. Picnic lunch with endless Coke and chips, $30. An afternoon of fishing with your child, 
priceless. Some things have worth that are beyond money. And that's part of what Isaiah is saying, too. Because Isaiah goes beyond the material realm and into the spiritual. And that's part of the beauty of the scriptures. It speaks to both. These ancient words deal with practical issues of human society, issues of poverty and dignity and social justice. But the message is also on a spiritual level. God is saying, you have worth, and you are welcome to come and buy. But you're going after the wrong things. You spend your money, your time, you invest yourself in things that do not satisfy. You think you're buying bread, but you're being fooled. The possessions, the prestige, the security, you may think they're valuable, but compared to a relationship with God, they are worthless, while a connection with your Creator is priceless. Today we are about halfway through our Lenten journey, and we are thirsty. Whether we know it or not, and if we stop and think about it at all, we'll realize that we are thirsty. We are thirsty for God. Lent can be hard. Life can be hard. And unless we drink regularly, we can become spiritually dehydrated. Today we hear the words, Ho, oh, everyone who is thirsty, come and drink. Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And we are being invited once again to God, the market of God's finest. We're invited to the table of our Lord once again. We are to come and buy without money that which is priceless. The bread of life is here for you. The cup of salvation is yours. You are a valued customer. You belong here. Amen.